So I'll start by saying I will want all our panelists to highlight what their sentiments on the current African exploration is. I, I would like to start with you, Vena. What's your sentiment on the current Africa exploration activities? The sentiment for Africa for exploration is actually on the way up. Now, I must say it is coming from a very low in terms of uh, the difficulties that we saw post-2014 and then post the recent crisis. As a result of those crises, of course, revenues reduced significantly. And so as a result, the amount of revenue for investment, for capital investment, as well for investment towards exploration, reduced significantly. But then one thing I'm certainly able to say is as a result of the uh, price development, which we have seen in recent years, uh, certainly companies have began to look at investing much more. And we can certainly see that with some of the things which we're seeing in offshore Namibia, offshore Angola, of, uh, even in uh, new frontiers like Zimbabwe, as well as Cote d'Ivoire. And so we are seeing increased exploration uh, programs which are being signed off, uh, investment decisions that are being made I think Exxon is drilling next year in Angola. We are likely to see, not we are likely, but we're certainly going to see two appraisal wells which are coming up offshore Namibia. That is great news for Namibia and for the region as well. As the core areas or hot spots of Africa, uh, 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 Africa exploration, has, has that evolved or changed in current times, Atisha? Uh, yeah, my answer is yes. Uh, so in the larger picture, if we see the whole uh, continent, you know, like Pierre Magnus has already said, it's a huge, huge continent with 54 countries, uh, vast coastline. Uh, hence, uh, the hotspots for the region, you know, they have never been localized. Uh, some specific countries where we saw... Uh, you know, continued activity over the time are uh, Angola, Nigeria, Egypt, which have been, you know, even through the downturn of the markets, they have been going on with the activity. It has not been as uh, as dead as it has been for some of the other countries in the continent. Uh, Vena, has, has there been any key trends observed um, in license round uh, uh, activities in, in, in Africa? You're sitting on the ground, so you probably know a little bit more than I do. In, in this regard? Oh, yes, absolutely. What we have seen is that there's been a 180% shift in the way that uh, governments, regulators approach license rounds. The days of big sign on bonuses or paying, you know, uh, big fees up front are over. A lot of what we're seeing now is, is, is pretty much data driven. Governments are bending over backwards to be able to provide access to data to explorers to ensure that they can quicken it. And this is one of the things which the chamber has been advising governments. If you put blockages at the forefront, then you make it difficult for explorers to be able to come in. You pretty much make it difficult for you to be able to get first oil in that sense. So uh, yes, there has been a significant amount of change. We are also seeing much more regular engagement in terms of not just licensing rounds traditionally, but also direct negotiations in that sense. Thank you for, for that, um, Atisha. Yourself and Vena, you spoke um, really in depth in, into this. And as you say, there's some surprise uh, uh, exploration activities um, uh, from the you know, countries like uh, Zimbabwe and Seychelles. So that, that speaks to me. I mean, obviously, it looks like all the coastal countries are quite, you know, busy in terms of opportunities. And of course, Zimbabwe is not quite coastal. It is landlocked. So um, uh, that's an interesting one as well. D does that mean um, there's a need for more exposure or penetration, you know, uh, penetration rates in terms of uh, uh, licensing? Does Africa need more? So according to me, what I believe is a successful lease round uh, not only depends on the number of blocks that has been awarded, it also depends on the companies who are acquiring the licenses, right? So there has to be a financial backing to do those exploration activities in the lease round awarded. So what we have done is until now, we have discussed all the positivities and painted a rosy picture around exploration in Africa, right? But what we have to understand here is you now, because of the incorporation of this low carbon into the corporate strategy, there has been a monumental shift on how companies are you know, going ahead with the exploration strategies. You know? 
Um, uh, Vena, what's your view? Pauso has given us uh, quite a lot of surface, uh, surface uh, conditions here. Uh, wh what are your views in terms of, you know, what Africa can do to improve uh, its exposure uh, in terms of licensing? Yes, um, one of the things which needs to be clear is geology has to work. We can say all what we want, but it has to be the right geology. And for that to happen, of course, the African countries themselves need to invest, at least initially around data acquisition, to be able to make sure there is a right understanding of the geology which they have to offer, for even to be able to attract people to have a look uh, particularly when you talk about the onshore countries, the ones which are landlocked, uh, where there is uh, much more of a difficulty to be able to uh, access and take out the oil, if at all you find. I look at countries like Niger, which have done a great job, you know, in trying to open up their country and to open up the basin. Uh, there's now a pipeline which is going to go from the Agadez Basin uh, off to Benin, and that is going to open up the country. That's it. But there's a lot. It is significantly underexplored, significantly underexplored. But for that to happen as well, people need to have easy access to data to be able to make the first move. We need to look at fiscal terms. There's no point having a great geology and having the resources, but then having fiscal terms that are pretty much either seen as predatory or not competitive at all in the market. Uh, if at all you don't have the right kind of fiscal terms, people go somewhere else. And so Africans and African countries need to understand that. The work programs need to be reasonable. You need to be able to see what's going on on an international basis to be able to provide competitive terms. And lastly, access to data has to be easy, make easy, as easy as possible. That's the name of the game. We are in a transition period where there is a significant push to be able to make sure that there is decarbonization. And so only those projects that can pretty much shorten the time from exploration, from the time you do this to the time you have first oil, the shorter the time, the more attractive the project is. If it's going to take long, as long as it takes, as we have traditionally seen in some African countries, where it's taken 10 years from the time you explore to the time you go to market with the oil, then it becomes unattractive for investors. Pauza, I'm going to bring you on here. What, what do you view as the role of new discoveries in, in Africa? There are quite a number, number of discoveries uh, that, that has occurred. Yeah, so... Personally, in my opinion, I believe that, you know, the role of discoveries can be broken down into two major categories, which could be short-term or a long-term role that our discoveries can play. Uh, we, have discovered, we have discussed a lot on the short-term role that discoveries can play. You know, it could lead to a rise in exploration activities. Uh, you know, companies' interest could continue to, to unlock the exploration potential, as we have rightly discussed throughout, and could, uh, companies would look to increase their resource base, you know, understanding of the subsurface unearthing volumes as much as possible. And ad additionally, it could also lead to an influx of investments, uh, which which we have rightly seen as is the case in Namibia or South Africa, following the discoveries such as Venus Graf in Namibia and Brunpada and Louis Part in uh, South Africa, right? So. Following those discoveries, there has been majors who are walking into those blocks, uh, even though it's unexplored. We see uh, recently we saw Chevron moving back into Namibia after 19 years. Uh, they, they were the pioneers of Namibian exploration, having discovered Kudu in 1974, right? But uh, so following that, there has been a large number of uh, wells which have been drilled offshore in Namibia, especially uh, towards the Walvis Basin. I think it is around 26 or 28 wells which have been drilled. Uh, uh, which which has uh, resulted in uncommercial discoveries, either uncommercial or dry wells. But uh, these two discoveries have you know you know propelled or pulled the Chevron back into Namibia. So after 19 years in exile, so that's a very good sign of how exploration have been developing and how these big companies are now seeing these countries as, as an area of investment where where they could benefit from. Vena, again, you're on ground, and I'm going to pull you on on this one. Do you have any comments on the prospectivity or the potential of, you know, the recent Venus and Graf uh, discoveries and possible implications? Well, uh, one thing, one thing uh, we can't say is the exact, uh, you know, potential because uh, Total and Shell are keeping that close to their chests. But if you are to look at the indications of both of them fast tracking and bringing actually forward. 
uh, uh, their appraisal wells, which they're going to do end of this year. That should give you a sense of how important uh, those discoveries are in that sense. Uh, from what you hear from the grapevines, uh, you know, both of them could lead to Namibia being somewhere between 400 and 500,000 barrels. I don't know. So uh, I am not part of the companies. Uh, but that is what you hear out of the grapevine in that sense overall. Excellent. Per Magnus, your view on that? Uh, I think that the main bottleneck for exploration in Africa is, is, not, is definitely not resources, probably not licensing either. It is capital for, uh, for, for drilling these exploration wells. And I think that uh, that capital would be available with more kind of integrated business plans, you know, that uh, you, you, you drill a well uh, and you find oil and gas and you have a business plan to somewhat monetize that uh, locally. I think that is going to be more and more important. Uh, and of course, that uh, the, these business plans, they have to also account for decarbonization. Otherwise, you will not get the investors. Uh, uh, foreign investors will only come if you have a decarbonization plan. But also, it's enough investors in Africa. There's a lot of wealthy people in Africa. So, it's all, but 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 my uh, feeling about um, wealthy individuals in Africa, they like to invest in something that they can almost be certain to get the money back. They don't like to take a risk on an exploration well because uh, in in fifty percent of the cases, you lose the money. Do you think Africa can fully monetize its subsurface potential? Then, I I absolutely do. I'm, I'm an eternal optimist when it comes to this one. Um, I think uh, a lot of the countries, uh, I take Angola as an example, have learned from uh, business practices that were not encouraging in the past. And that is why we've seen some of the changes that we've seen. That's why we saw them over the last five years, changing regulations around that. When you encourage investors including internal investors in that sense, you are likely to get people look and address and take opportunity. Thank you so much for that. But, you know, with Palzo giving us this in-depth view um, uh, about potentials, what, what, what does a short-term and a long-term exploration outlook, you know, from Africa, what does it look like, Atisha? Uh, I think in the short term, we think um, uh, there will be a significant revival in the exploration activity, uh, uh, may, more, mainly in the Western basins. Uh, you know, South African basins have uh, already kind of proven their stake. Uh, but we need to first understand a bit of the geology here. You know, so this uh, exploration is kind of a learning curve. So nothing happens out of blue. So I think Western uh, basins have started seeing the light when Jubilee was discovered in Ghana. And uh, that kind of started building the trust uh, the companies needed that they can go into the deep waters and start exploring these places which we call turbidites or the turbidite systems. And over the time, companies have drilled multiple wells, found multiple discoveries from Senegal to you know Ghana, from Ghana to now Namibia, South Africa. So it's almost a similar place which are targeted. And with every well that is drilled, uh, in you know geological sense, every well is a knowledge well. So they are gaining information, they are understanding. So I would say. Uh, they are drilling the most, uh, you know, significant uh, prospects in the first, and they are getting a more understanding where, you know, the petroleum system is working or not. And this knowledge will be the driver for, uh, you know, short term activity. And we would see the focus mostly in uh, the western basins and also the northern basins we would also potentially see some revival in east africa but east africa uh, already some wells were drilled they were dry so there are uh, in addition to the surface factors like infrastructure and fiscal regimes and other things there is also probably a road block in terms of you know uh, subsurface potential because uh, they first need to uh, monetize already the discoveries that are there so they need to uh, you know uh, uh, make some revenue from there and then probably f uh, we would see some future exploration so from my perspective uh, activity will be mostly focused in western and the northern basins well I, I think um 
you know, we need to be watching in as much as we're talking about Africa, uh, short term, long term. We need to be watching the price, what's happening around the price space globally and what's happening uh, with respect to global demand. Um, I mean, if we see China has, uh, you know, really slowed down significantly due to COVID uh, over the last couple of years, if we see the Chinese economy picking up, uh, you know, and India roaring back uh, the way we expected, uh, evidently that is going to also drive the requirements or the demand uh, for exploration on the ground in that if you look at what Per Magnus is saying, that is also a significant demand pocket, which means domestic gas and oil utilization on the continent. So the more you can have that, the more you can create the space for markets, for power generation, for this coast to be set up properly, uh, automatically you are going to see the market forces drive the requirements and the demand for investment in exploration, as well as infrastructure, uh, when we talk about gas, gas infrastructure. So uh, I think we need to be watching what's happening on the global space with respect to demand and price, and it's going to tell us where we are going to go with respect to exploration.